supposed to supply the monkeys, but when the pandemic struck, Beijing shut the door. And Cambodian breeding facilities like these, filmed by NBC News, stepped in to fill the orders. What is that leading to in terms of the international trade of monkeys right now? This trade is so violent. It's, it's so dark. It's so shady. Just last month, the Department of Justice charged two Cambodian government officials and six others linked to this breeding facility with illegally exporting monkeys caught in the wild to the U.S. Some Cambodian monkeys have ended up here at this massive facility in Texas. Last year, an executive was convicted of lying to federal agents about visits to monkey suppliers in Cambodia. Welcome to Action Hour. I'm here with Lisa Jones Engel, who is the primate scientist for PETA. Thank you for being here, Dr. Jones Engel. We wanted to ask you what is going on with this whole story about thousand monkeys who got caught in the pipeline and now their fate is uncertain. Lindsay, thank you so much for, for having me back on and for giving us you know, a chance to talk about these thousand animals. And these, these monkeys, these are these are young animals. These are actually called long-tailed macaques. They're the naturally, um, they're naturally occurring in Southeast Asia. These thousand in particular come from Cambodia. They were ripped from the wild, ripped from their moms, ripped from their families, stuffed into these monkey farms there. They were then kind of their identities were stolen. There was this whole kind of really nefarious, ugly, nasty mushing and mashing of of disqualified monkeys and regular monkeys. They were monkeys were stuffed into wooden crates, placed into the bellies of planes, flown to the US. And then this is where it gets really interesting because the US Fish and Wildlife then stepped in and said, hey, the, these monkeys prove to us, US monkey importer, that these are captive bred monkeys because that's the law. The law says that the animals who are coming out of Cambodia must be captive bred. And the importers couldn't prove that. And so right now, what we are seeing is kind of this, this accumulation of illegal activity by the importers that's being called out. But unfortunately, what's, who's, who's caught in the middle? Who's suffering the most? It's these thousand long-tailed macaques. Let's just back up for one second. I have a picture here of the woman who was in, uh, who was threatened with rabies because she got right up close to one of the macaques that had escaped. And this is the Pennsylvania story. And from what you've told me, this sort of, this story that broke in the news was the catalyst. And we want you to take us through all the steps and what happened over the last year because PETA has made some outstanding progress. So you wanna go back to that story a little bit and then go, we'll go forward from there? Sure. It was in January 21st of 2022, kind of the dead of winter up in Pennsylvania. And a truck had just picked up a hundred long-tailed macaques. They, they were actually, they had just landed in the US. They were being transported to an unnamed, unidentified quarantine facility. The driver was careless. He got um, clipped by a dump truck the, the, the crash was so violent that dozens of monkey cages or monkey crates spilled out on this Pennsylvania highway. The temperature was well below freezing. Some of the crates burst open. These long-tailed macaques, three of them actually managed to, to escape. They ran off into the, the area right around the, this major highway, you know, kind of hiding out in wood piles up in trees. The, the police force was activated. The CDC was, was activated. And the decision was made that the risk that these animals represented was so great that the CDC said, we want them shot on site. Um, Michelle Fallon, you know, just a, a, she was just driving behind. She saw the accident. She did what any good Samaritan would do, any animal lover would do. She jumped out. She checked on the people. She then went over to the crates. She thought they were cats because no one expects to find a bunch of monkey crates on a highway in, in Pennsylvania. She looked down to see if she could help the animals. She pulled back the flimsy material. And one of the monkeys there did exactly what any monkey would do. It, they were terrified. All of a sudden, this person is in their fate or in their face. They, they vocalize it. And you know, some spittle got into, into Michelle's eye. And then this started an odyssey for, for Michelle of basically 
you know, the CDC saying, ah, oh, this is a problem. Maybe this is not a problem. The Pennsylvania Department of Health saying, ah, oh, okay, give us some of your blood. And this poor woman has been, she went through the ringer on this because the authorities weren't transparent with her. Right. And we never heard what happened to the monkeys that, um, that they got back, right? That were sent back to them. We never heard the fate of them. And that brings me to the next question. What about these thousand monkeys that are now caught? They were going transporting these monkeys illegally back and forth for all this time. PETA kind of got the ball rolling here, you know, got the signal out there. Everybody's watching now. Now what happens to these monkeys? What's, what's, what's their fate? Wow. You know, you just made such a good point. We never knew what happened to those 97 who survived that crash. We, and we, we certainly asked. Um, you know, whether or not they ended up, whether they, they survived. I mean, that was a violent crash. How many of them were bruised and battered and broken and had to be euthanized or, or killed, not euthanized, killed. But it gives, that was, you know, a, a fraction of the animals that we're talking about now. There are at least a thousand, maybe 1,200 monkeys that U.S. importer Charles River actually brought into this country. Um, these animals were brought in on CITES permits. This is the permit they always travel with. These documents were falsified. These were not captive born monkeys. These were likely wild caught monkeys. And now these, these 1,000, 1,200 monkeys are, they are in purgatory. They are, we don't know exactly where they are. We're pretty sure that most of them are at the um, Charles River facility in Houston, Texas. You know, another part of them may be up in a facility up in Frederick, Maryland that actually feeds into the NIH. But these, these monkeys are now pawns. They can't be used in biomedical experiments in the US because they were basically illegally um, accessed, illegally sourced. So there are a couple of options. Um, Fish and Wildlife Department of Justice can seize these animals and turn them over to sanctuary, which is obviously what we want to happen. Charles River has the option of actually re-exporting these, these animals back to Cambodia or back to any country that would take them. And the third option is they could be seized and killed. And, you know, obviously these monkeys, again, these are young animals. These are animals who, through no fault of their own, have gotten caught up in this horrifically and unspeakably cruel monkey exploitation, experimentation pipeline. And Charles River owes them. The public, we have to take responsibility for them too. And I do want to invite Charles River Rivers Labs on at any time to dialogue. We'd love to hear their side of the story. However, they were charged by the um, government and this was all proven. This is documented. This is not hearsay. What you're explaining to us now is already. Uh, but the fact is they somehow may be able to wiggle out of paying for these animals to go to sanctuary. And that's the the most important point. We're going to go into a lot more of this story, but we do want to tell people that we need you to go to PETA.org and sign the petition to let them know that we want those people yeah. held accountable. And PETA has offered uh, to, uh, to pay a million dollars to put them in sanctuary. And do you have a sanctuary set up? Can you talk about that a little bit, that situation? Yes. We do, and, and and thank you for letting me talk a little bit about what sanctuary would mean for these animals. Again, Charles River has to do the right thing. Um, these animals cannot be used in experiments. They should never have been brought in to begin with or even used, but they can't be used in US experiments. Um, they can't be returned to the wild. You know, They're already kind of caught up in the system. So there's one option, and that option is to send them to sanctuary. And when PETA was notified, when I was notified several months ago that you know, this was kind of all coming down. I got on the phone with every sanctuary director in the, this country that I could get a hold of. And I said, hey, this is this is a huge ask, but you know, we have anywhere from 360 to, to 1200 monkeys. Could you take them? And you know, the, the sanctuary system in, in the US for primates is, it's a young system. It's it's every day they are struggling to make sure that there's, there's food and, and caregivers for these animals. And no one, that I talked to had the, the space. They didn't have the resources until I got Angela Grimes on the phone from Born Free USA. And to this day, I will never forget, 
everyone else was saying to me, oh, th this can't be done. You know, there were even people within my own institution were like, ah, this is crazy. This is, this is, who can handle so many monkeys? Angela said, huh, I, I, I think we can do that. And together with Liz Tyson, who is the, the director of the, the facility, the Born Free USA facility, which is down in Texas, they have from the very beginning been willing to dialogue about this, willing to figure out, to strategize, to you know, put whatever pieces they, they can together. And they've, they've gone to the Department of Justice and Fish and Wildlife and said, okay, here's the plan. We can do this. We will take lifelong responsibility for these animals. 20 years these animals could live. We will, we will be there every day holding their hand, basically. But you gotta pay for it. You know, it, this, you've gotta pay for the, the food, the housing, the extra staff, the, the veterinary care, the, the, the enclosures for that. If Charles River steps up and does this, if the government forces this issue, Born Free USA will, will open, is ready. They are waiting there with their hands for, for these monkeys. That is just incredible. I do want to ask you now to talk about the efficacy of, I guess my question is, these animals are coming in. They're sick. They're being transported. It's not natural. They're being pulled from the wild. And then they're being used to test, to do animal testing that is proven not to be, uh, not to work in humans. 95% of the um, tests that are done that work, medication or drugs that work on animals do not work on humans. Mm -hmm. And that this continues. Can you talk a little bit about that whole criteria on what they go through, what the monkeys go through, et cetera? Um, yeah, I just just want to warn you. This is this is not going to be a pretty conversation. Um, so let's try to keep it light. But, I'm going to try to keep it light. Um, try the, to keep it. I will do my best to keep it light. But there is there is no light for these animals. I mean, in some cases, literally no light. You know, animal experimentation in the U.S. means that these animals can be kept in underground facilities. They can be in cages that are the size of like your lower kitchen cabinet. Um, that's when they get here to the U.S. The, the process of actually being taken from the, the forest, kind of recycled, relabeled, repackaged, mislabeled in these breeding farms in, in Southeast Asia and Mauritius, then boxed up, flown to the U.S., packed up in trucks, trucked, you know, thousands of miles across the country into quarantine where, you know, these animals are dying in quarantine. They're actually arriving here in this country having picked up really dangerous zoonotic diseases that can be transmitted from, from primate to human. They're picking up these diseases all along the, this pipeline. They get here, they're stressed out. Their immune system is, is kind of, it's, it's weakened psychologically. They're a mess. They're, they're pulling their hair out. They're, they're biting themselves. They're spinning around in the cages. And then somehow, the, the industry thinks, after failing for 60 years, that these diseased and distressed monkeys are somehow representative of, of the natural human immune system. And they're not. The species differences are obvious. The, the co-infections, the, the unintended co-infections that the, these monkeys pick up along this pipeline, in the breeding farms, in the quarantine facilities, all of this undermines the utility, the validity of the data. And as you said, you know, the scientists themselves have acknowledged that 90 to 95% of the time, what works in monkeys, what works in the animal model, fails to translate effectively into the human model. Think about this. We have had six HIV vaccines that have been developed since the, the HIV, the global pandemic in the ninth, early 1980s. All six of those vaccines were shown, were shown to be safe and effective and to protect monkeys from HIV. All six of those vaccines, which were supposedly worked in, in the monkey model, were shown to work in the monkey model when moved into the human clinical trials. Every one of those vaccines has failed in human clinical trials. What works in monkeys does not work in humans. And that beca is because in large part, monkeys are not, you know, little humans with, with furry tails. 
Now, let me ask you what the monkey, te monkey testing labs, what is their defense? What is their argument to continue to do this type of testing? And why are they getting away with uh, misinformation if it is so? I don't think they, they don't, they, they their, their scientific arguments don't hold up. There's that they simply do not hold up. The, the data are very clear. What works in a monkey model consistently fails in the human model. What the industry is really good at doing, though, is is focusing on our fear, and you know, saying, "Hey, if if we don't test these these compounds on 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 these these monkeys, you you know, grandma is not going to get uh, an Alzheimer drug. If we don't continue to using 30, 40, 50, 60 thousand monkeys a year, you know, you're not going to get your next cancer treatment." But that's that's just a basic. That's just a downright lie, and. I think what we can really point to is actually the FDA Modernization Act, which was passed yes. late last year. This act, which Congress, which was bipartisan support in the Congress, um, Senator um, Cory Booker, Senator Rand Paul, Paul actually came in and they put this FDA Modernization Act for the first time since 1938, the FDA, the, the government agency, which is as risk averse as you could possibly imagine, has been looking at the, the animal data. They've been looking at the how long it takes to get drugs from the, the, the preclinical stage into the clinical stage and then effectively approved for, for treatments in humans. And they said, Eesh, you know, relying on these, these animal tests is not working. It's just what's been shown to be safe and effective, safe and effective in in monkeys doesn't prove to be safe and effective often enough in humans. And on the other side, drugs that were actually tested in the animal model, and the animal model um, data suggests that actually they're not safe or they're not effective, those, those drugs have stayed on the shelf. And what the scientists, what the FDA have determined is that it's time to change. It's time to, to give the companies, to give pharma, the option of focusing on non-animal testing. And that's what the FDA Modernization Act is. And the FDA Modernization Act capped off 2022 as kind of the, what I like to think is kind of the, the final nail in the, the pharma's use of, and basically it's, it's gonna shut down pharma's use of, of animals. So where are we in this process of getting this to be uh, a completed uh, situation in a reality? What do we have to do as people that find it abhorrent that we are testing on animals? You, you got to keep asking questions. You actually have to keep, you know, go to PETA.org, look at the information that we have out there about the, the monkey importation pipeline, reach out to Fish and Wildlife Service, reach out to the CDC, reach out to NIH, reach out to the Congress people. We make it very easy on, on PETA. You know, with a couple of clicks, you can actually send the letters to them, letting these stakeholders know, hey, the scientists themselves have said that there are alternatives to using animals. There are better ways to get these drugs and treatments into the human, into the, into the human population. That's what we want our taxpayer dollars to, to be focused on, not on these archaic, and again, unspeakably cruel animal tests. So it is absolutely about using your voice, using your vote, letting everyone know this is what you want. You want, you want animal testing to end and you want human relevant testing to really explode the way that it needs to because it is growing dramatically. That's amazing. And we do want to, we're showing up here a website that they can go to. Uh, and we're going to put all of these links within the post so people can get their own information, um, check it out for themselves, not just take our word for it. And also, um, we want to ask them again to go to PETA.org and sign the petition because it's so important that you do, that we get this to go through and these monkeys are accounted for and they go to sanctuary where they need to go. Um, Dr. Lisa, you started your career in the animal lab testing industry. You have an amazing story. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? 
And just before you do, I'm going to play a clip uh, that you were involved with um, these monkeys, I think here, uh, working with them. So let's play this. So tell us a little bit about your work. Well, first, I want to just tell you a little bit about those monkeys. Sure. Those monkeys, you know, we haven't seen the, the thousand monkeys that Charles River has, has basically brought into this country illegally, illegally. But they look just like the monkeys you just saw. So those are long-tailed macaques. Those guys are, you know, between two and three, three years old. Um, those monkeys were actually at a temple in Thailand. Um, so my work, my team was actually in in Asia for about 12 or 15 years. And what our, our job was to basically look how infectious diseases were moving between human populations and monkey populations in both directions. What the, the monkeys could potentially be transmitting to humans. And what we saw much more often was what the humans were transmitting to, to the monkeys. And so that involved actually working in, in a bunch of countries, Indonesia, Bangladesh, Thailand, Cambodia, Vietnam, Nepal, Myanmar, and collecting, trapping and sampling these monkeys. They would come into our, our large traps. We'd you know, close the door. We would sedate them. We'd collect samples from them. We'd wake them back up. And unlike the industry, we, we would let them go. We'd also sample the humans who were interacting with them. So we had this really um, important data set was also an epidemiological study of seeing again in over time what was happening with these two populations how were were infectious diseases moving back and forth um, so my my team did that work for for many many years the the rationale that I used and at that time I was actually embedded in the Washington National Primate Research Center was that if I could help the scientific community better understand the monkey model, then, then the science that was being done on these animals would therefore be better. Because that's the thing about any type of model. Your model is only as good as it is well characterized. What I found right. was the, the, industry, the industry is not interested in well characterized models. The industry is interested in one thing, that is pushing as many monkeys as they can get their hands on through their pipeline. And they don't care whether it's a male monkey, a female monkey, a young monkey, an old monkey, a monkey with a disease, a monkey from Mauritius, a monkey from Cambodia, a rhesus macaque, a long-tailed macaque, a pigtailed macaque. They just want a monkey to shove through that system and to kind of check check that box. Um, and I, I'm done with that. Yes. And then you moved over to working with PETA. I wonder, before we go on, though, I, talking about the monkey pipeline, um, this is a picture that we had. I got this, I believe it, it's 2021, mm -hmm. the date. I can't swear to it, folks. But how much of what's going on right now, how much of this will be disrupted and destroyed? Is I know that's a difficult question, especially asking a no. scientist, but, um, you know, to quantify something like that. But what do you think? I mean, this is horrific what we're looking at here. This is horrific. And so what we're looking at is these are monkeys who are already in the U.S. And the, this um, figure was actually generated from data that Peter um, got through Freedom of Information Act um, of mm -hmm. documents, these things called certificates of veterinary inspection. That again, once the monkey's in this country, every time it moves from laboratory to laboratory or breeding facility to breeding facility, this monkey has to be accompanied by this document. And you can see, I mean, there are they're like monkey super highways in some places, Texas going up to the, the Northeast, Pacific Northwest heading down, Florida kind of sending animals out. Um, you know what? I If we were to make that and trying to get these data in real time, basically impossible. But given these indictments that are coming down right now, we have three major monkey importers, monkey users who are under investigation right now. We have Charles River. We have Innative, Invigo, or in bio, Biosciences, and we have Worldwide Primates. Um, all of these are, these companies 
are basically finding themselves kind of with monkeys on their hands that they can't move because fish and wildlife has said, you cannot prove to us that these animals were captive bred. And so a lot of that movement is really slowing down. And this is, this is something that, that we appear, we are very proud to, to have been kind of part of really kind of helping the public understand, helping the officials understand you know, going to USDA and making complaints about animals being shipped who should not have been shipped, um, going to, to Fish and Wildlife and raising issues about, hey, are you allowing these companies to re-export animals? It is about keeping the pressure on the, the people who, the agencies that have the ability to make the decisions, um, you know, us going to the CDC and saying, wait, you are allowing the importation each year over the last five years of about 30,000 monkeys. And your own documents are saying that these monkeys are coming in with things like malaria, tuberculosis, um, hemorrhagic fever viruses, salmonella, shigella, yersinia, campylobacter, um, tier one infectious agents, select agents. Really, CDC? You're you're allowing these animals to be moved all to come into this country and then to be moved all around? No, that's that's not that's not good for science. That is really dangerous for public health because you know what? Accidents happen and monkeys can spill out onto them, onto the roads, or monkeys can escape facilities, or people within the facilities can get bitten and exposed, or monkeys can pee and poop at these facilities and what they actually then can transmit these pathogens to the soil and to the water. So every single bit of information is kind of stacking up one after the other for this industry to finally, to recognize the, the monkey era of experimentation is done. And so the industry, pharma needs to do what they say they do well, which is to innovate. And innovation means focusing on these non-animal alternatives. I just want to jump in here and say, uh, I, we'd like to ask people, these are two very, very important links to go to and sign these petitions. And one is PETA.org pipeline, and the other one is PETA.org macaque. macaque. So, yeah, so please, please, please go yeah. and take care of that right now because without your help, also one more thing, uh, this is a hashtag, a very important hashtag that um, we would like you guys to start using because you do need a push from the public, right? This is not a done deal. And I do want to go back and kind of go through the steps and the progress. There's a couple more things we want to bring out, but uh, it's not a done deal. So no. so it's, talk about how important that is. It's it's not a done deal. You know, we, PETA is is... You know, certainly when we learned about these these thousand monkeys that Charles River should, could, must turn over to sanctuary. And we, when we learned that Born Free USA basically stepped up and said, we, we, we'll take them. Give us the money. PETA put a million dollars right on the table and said, OK, let's start with a million dollars. But it's going to take a lot more than that. And so Charles River should definitely be responsible for the long term care of these animals. But, you know, if. Right now, we need several million dollars to base, to get these animals into Born Free's hand. And so soon, keep an eye out for it. You're going to see a kind of a, a public appeal, a public ask from us to really kind of help kind of build the, the, the war chest. This is actually, this is kind of like a war chest that, that, we, um, that we need because these, these animals, well, actually, you know what? I take this back. Let me back up. That's not a war chest. We're not building war chests. We're building a, a nest egg mm. for these monkeys. We're, we need to make sure that Born Free has the resources that they need in order to, to care for these animals for their lifetime. And we expect Charles River to, to step up with that. But I think also the public is going to have to step up too because it's this is 20 years of, of care these monkeys are going to need. Right. And it would be wonderful if we could get uh, support for these sanctuaries. It could be a place for people to come to see the animals, 
not infringing on their privacy, but in ways that are they can interact with them without disrupting them in their natural setting, as natural as it can be. You know, a sanctuary is not the jungle, but it would be as close as they could be. And you also mentioned that we need more. We're going to need in the future when this closes down, we'll need more sanctuaries. Will it just be for monkeys? But there's a lot of animals that are tested in labs. So it would be, can you address that a little bit? This is, this is, this is the next step. You're right. There are, you know, several million. I think I'm trying to remember what the actual number was. Uh, a paper came out last year talking about the, the millions of mice and rats that are in, in the labs, the zebrafish, the ferrets, the rabbits, the, um, the guinea pigs, the, the finches, the, the pigs, the dogs, the monkeys. There are so many species that this industry has just been consuming and, and breeding and, and producing more of and then grinding up more of them. And they all deserve homes. They, none of these animals should be um, expected to stand in for humans because they're not humans. If we want human treatments, we need to, to focus on human relevant testing. And that's that's human tissues, that that's bioinformation, that that's human relevant. But these all these these non-human animals who have been given up their lives and have given up their children's lives and their children's children's lives. Oh my uh, God. The ones who are there now, yes, we owe them sanctuary. And this is the the industry is gonna have to to reckon with this. The, the universities who are using these animals, the National Primate Research Centers, the National Institutes of Health, the pharma, the pharma all, of these in, all of these groups are gonna to have to come, come to terms with there is a responsibility to these animals. And there's a precedent for this. We did this with chimpanzees several years ago. You know, the, the National Institutes of Health, the scientists basically came together and said, Ew, you know what? These chimps aren't giving us the data we thought we were going to get. And, um, mm, oh, the chimps are now listed as endangered. Oh, we, that was the question we just got here. We from um, Tom Cell. Now, can you go into that a little bit more about how exactly how much protection they do have? And I, I know that you said you had, were explaining that to me. It's a little complicated. So can you go into that a bit? Well, you know, what we're seeing... What we saw with the chimpanzees ten or about 10 years ago was this kind of this real battle to make sure that they were listed as endangered. There was no split listing with if you're in a captive, a captive chimp, you're not, you're not considered endangered. But what we are seeing right now is basically history repeating itself. Because last year in June, the International Union for the Conservation of Nature came out and said, after an extensive review and assessment of long-tailed macaque populations and the threats to long-tailed macaque populations throughout their, their natural range, the IUCN, the global authority on this said, elevated long-tailed macaques and pigtailed macaques from vulnerable to endangered. And particularly for long-tailed macaques, they said that the their extraction, their exploitation for use in the biomedical industry was one of the driving forces that led to this wow. astonishing population declines. And so we are now, the IUCN gave us the, basically said to the world, hey, we are gonna lose this monkey unless immediate action is taken to protect the environment, to protect the populations, to stop the threats. Um, and as American citizens, knowing that the US is the number one importer no. consumer, user of the long-tailed macaque, we are particularly, um, it is our job to say to, to our industry, to say to our government, to say to our stakeholders, uh-uh, you know what, we, I am not going to be part of, of a system that has driven a mammal, a primate, towards extinction. And again, for what? Because using these animals we know does not lead to improvements in human health. Let's so look is, at. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. No, no. Go ahead. So this, this is the. Go ahead and finish your thought. Sorry. This is this IUCN uplisting was the first step. The next step is to to kind of get them moved on to the Endangered Species Act, and that's that's certainly in the works. 
and then getting them uplisted on CITES to Appendix 1. These are all various steps that, that need to be taken, and some of them can happen pretty quickly if Fish and Wildlife in particular gets enough pressure from the public that says, hey, th these animals deserve to be protected under the Endangered Species Act. And we're going to go ahead and put up links for people to go ahead and take action and uh, mm -hmm. contact them, Great. as well as some of the other organizations. I wanted to have you talk a little bit about the difference between in vitro and in vivo, which is, okay, obviously vivisection, right? right. And um, the efficacy of it and the danger to humans, because people are still, a lot of people believe that animal testing is something that is necessary. I know that the Susan uh, G. Coleman, uh, that people show up, activists show up and try to talk about animal testing and they get a violent reaction because oh. people think that it's threatening their loved ones who have cancer. They don't realize that it's slowing down the uh, process of them getting the right medications they need because when the tests fail in animals, isn't it true that then the humans don't get the drugs that would may likely work in them? Exactly. And again, it all comes down, you know, the industry like to, likes to say that non-human primates, these, these macaques or baboons or marmosets are our closest relatives. Oh, okay, that's true. But there are 24 million years of evolutionary distance between a long-tailed macaque and a human. And in 24 million years, a whole lot happens to your immune system. A whole lot happens to actually every biological system within from your, your, you know, your brain, to your heart, to your lungs, to your kidneys, to how your blood moves, to how you respond to different infections. What, what works in a monkey consistently fails in humans. So, I mean, how many times more do we need to see this failure? 90 to 95% it fails. That's, that's an F. That, that's like a, an F minus, minus, minus. Um, and so these, these in vivo, these, these in animal, in um, live, vivo live studies are just, they're not working, but the in vitro, that is the important thing about the in vitro is that increasingly they're relying upon human tissues. These right. bioengineered organs on a chips that are linked together using, and this is all built on human tissue for humans. So the drugs that we're developing are meant to, to work in humans. We've cured cancer so many times in mice, you know, gazillion times we've, we've cured cancer in mice. But wow, we can't do it in humans because we've been using mice tissue. We use human tissue and actually that will actually translate into live functioning whole humans improvements. So this is really an important uh, thing to bring out. The fact that we are not only harming animals for people that don't care about animals. Uh, and there are some, unfortunately, I don't. We are, you are harming people. You are holding back people from, that might have gotten medical care that could save their lives. Uh, it's ruining the environment. Um, it's affecting every, as we know, every creature has its place in the ecological system. It's being torn apart. There's so many bad things going on here. And finally, PETA is making amazing progress. And we really have to do everything we can to help. Um, what are some, are there, is there anything that stands out that you'd like in terms of the progress that was made that we haven't talked about that you'd like to cover? I don't mean to put you on the spot. No, but. it's, I mean, let's just think about Again, what has happened since the last time we talked, since that, that accident up in Danville, Pennsylvania? Right. You know, PETA has, that accident led us to submitting a number of public um, records requests, FOIA requests, Freedom of Information requests to the CDC. As those requests started to get filled, we started to collect the data that said, oh man, these monkeys want lots and lots of monkeys are coming in. They're coming in sick, they're dying in transport, they're dying in quarantine, they're bringing these horrific diseases with them. You know, the a couple of months after that, the IUCN comes out and says, uplist these animals to endangered because in large part of this experimentation industry. After that, we get more documents from the CDC and we start seeing, holy moly, these animals are coming in with things that, I mean, can really kill us to the point of, 
if the industry's argument is that you bring in monkeys to, to try to prevent the next pandemic, but in fact, these animals are coming in, having picked up pathogens throughout this pipeline that could trigger the next pandemic, then you know the system is broken. Move into November, we see the indictments coming through a five-year investigation by Fish and Wildlife Service, just talking about the horrific, the blatant illegality of you know taking dead monkeys from the, the, the farms, taking off their collars, their, their identity collars, putting them on a wild caught, you know, a, a monkey that, that's coming through the black market, stuffing that monkey in the, in the box and, and sending it. Um, and again, these big companies just saying, oh, just give me, give me 500 monkeys, give me a thousand monkeys and not, and not asking about this. Then in December, that FDA Modernization Act, which basically said, you know what? We are not going to require pharma. We are no longer going to require pharma to, to follow the rule that had been in place for what, almost 80 years that said you have to use monkeys. The FDA Modernization Act removes that requirement and it says, hey, you want to submit non-animal testing um, alternatives, the data that you generate from that, we are going to accept that. The FDA, again, the most risk averse agency out there is, is realizing we really need to get something else. We need, we need to get the drugs in the pipeline in a way that's effective and animal relying on animal testing is not. We roll into to February and we see the world's largest mover and consumer of monkeys caught up in civil and criminal investigations here in the US, again, for their role in importing monkeys who were illegally sourced from the wild. And now we, we have these thousand, we have these thousand monkeys who, there is, there is only one, this pipeline has to end in one place for these animals. And that is in sanctuary in this country, give them what they deserve. And what they deserve is to live out their life in a way with, it's not gonna be living in a forest. You know, your monkey, you're living in the forest. There's nothing better than that. But there's no chance for these guys. They cannot go back. If they go back to Cambodia, they just get relabeled, repackaged, you know, and ground up by, wow. by, the industry, by somebody else. So they have to stay here. Warren Free USA is saying, hey, Give us the resources and we will provide for the lifetime care of these animals. And that's, wow, Lindsay, it's, that's where we are. I mean, we, this is, this is the beginning. I mean, the, the last 15, 16 months, we have just seen, again, every block that this industry has stood on to try to kind of tower over people and say, oh yes, you know, we must be allowed every monkey that we want. We must be allowed to do anything we want to these animals. We can get them wherever we want. We can stick them in any kind of cage. We can pull out anything of them that we want. You know, PETA and, and the other animal rights organization, we're just, we're just knocking them off those blocks. And so now this industry is down like, and they are cowering and they should be cowering because they are in the wrong. And we are here now to make sure that they, come on, do the right thing. Pay for your mistake. And more importantly, do what you're supposed to do really well, innovate, get these drugs into the human um, population, but do it using human relevant testing. Right, we don't wanna close any of these labs down. We want them to transcend and become better. We want them to continue and to thrive, but to get rid of the cruelty, to get rid of, it's beyond just, it's medieval cruelty. It's medieval level cruelty. But beyond that, it's actually hurting everyone and the environment. It just ha it's criminal. It has to be stopped. And we have to take the steps to do it. Please share out this video. Please use these this hashtag. Save 1,000 monkeys using this hashtag. Go to these different, uh, these, these links we're going to be putting up for you at the top of the post. Go to the links. Please sign. It takes a second. I did the first one at Sign the Petition PETA. It took me literally a minute, if that, uh, what, 60 seconds to do. It's very well set up. You don't have to search around for anything. Please, please, please do this. 
Dr. Lisa, do you have anything else you want to share? We're just about out of time. I just want to reiterate the power of going in and signing these and having these letters sent. You know, during the, over, we've been working on these thousand monkeys for, for several months now, and things really came to the head over the last month. And at some point, you know, it seemed like Fish and Wildlife and, and DOJ had kind of walked away. But the the outcry, the the supporters kind of contacting them with these emails, calling into them, really it brought them back to the table. And so we have to keep this pressure up. I do believe Fish and Wildlife wants to do the right thing by this. I do believe the DOJ, the Department of Justice, wants to do the right thing by by these monkeys. But Charles River is big, and they are they're they're powerful. And so we need to be equally powerful and, and make sure that the people who get to make the decisions hear our voices. Right. Absolutely. Thank you so much for being on. I would love to have you come back again with some more good news for us in the future. Everyone watching, please share out this video. Please take action. Please help save the monkeys. And thank you for watching. Bye-bye for now. Take care. Bye-bye.